Good day, Lauren. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Ah, thanks a lot. Yeah, I, I, uh, at my advanced age, it's always a uh, pleasure to have an opportunity to have an academic discussion. <laughs> well, I don't know how academic will be because I think I fall short in that category. But uh, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge Alex Salas, uh, my good friend Alex Salas, who set us up. Now, he's been doing a series of videos with you, or he's done a couple of interviews, and it's going to turn into four right. videos. Uh, he did some a couple of years ago, I think, and then he's done one more recently. But uh, he's the one who connected us and sent us up through email. And so this is the first time that we've met, and I had... I, I had no knowledge of you and your background, but I think it's very interesting because I've done a little bit of homework uh, leading up to this. But uh, for our audience, uh, can you please introduce yourself? And we're gonna take a, a running start at this and go through a couple of questions on this, but can you start with, uh, you know, where did you grow up? I grew up uh, outside of Hibbing, Minnesota, um, uh, it, the, the, along something called the Masaba Iron Range which was a, a huge vein that went for about 50 miles uh, east to west uh, and maybe about uh, five miles north and south. So it was a huge range of ore. My dad was a welder in an iron mine. My mother uh, was a, a grocery a checkout girl in a small uh, grocery store. And so, um, I grew up in a place where education was highly valued. Um, and because of the taxes paid by the mining companies, uh, the schools were excellent. You know, a lot of people think of rural uh, America and oh my goodness, those poor people. But uh, our, our teachers received the highest salaries at that time of any uh, districts in the state of Minnesota. And so we were able to attract uh, really an excellent group of teachers. And uh, that, that was the beginning really of my uh, kind of love of education. So can you tell us uh, where did you then go off to college <clears throat> and what did you study? Well, I went to a, a private liberal arts college called McAllister College. And, and the only reason I got in there was they uh, were, were trying to diversify. Uh, they had too many wealthy kids. <laughs> and they wanted to attract uh, working class kids, but they wanted working class kids with good grades and high SAT scores and so forth and so on. And I was lucky enough to qualify and uh, got a scholarship and um, uh, went there graduated in 1967. Then I taught for, uh, with, a, with a bachelor's in uh, mathematics mm -hmm. and uh, a minor in uh, religion, uh, just to balance life out. <laughs> if you didn't like the quantities, maybe there's something qualitative within religion. Um, and it's actually that, 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 Balance is something that has stayed with me for life. I, you know, I really see that uh, there are questions that are best answered this way, and there are questions that are best answered some other way. And then I taught for four years uh, mathematics in um, uh, first of all high school and then in junior high school, uh, two years each. And I realized I uh, was not a very good teacher. Um, I, I didn't have the, I was, I was too curious <laughs> I, to, to uh, be pedantic. <laughs> I just, I couldn't get into the, uh, the, the, the pedagogic role. I mean, I just, it just felt alien to me. And so I, while I was going to, uh, to uh, what I was teaching, I was picking up my master's in the summer. And uh, so it was January of the, my third year of teaching, and I realized that I didn't want to teach any longer. So I went to see my master's advisor, and I said, uh, you know, I don't know what I want to do, but I, this isn't what I want to do. And he said, well, what you have to do what everybody does then, go back to school. <laughs> so, and he says, and he happened, his name was Moy Gum. He was a Korean. 
Uh, and he happened to be a, a, a student of Benjamin Bloom at the University of Chicago. That's where he got his doctorate. So he said, I'll call, I'll call Bloom and see if there's anything that he can do. Well, the timing was perfect that uh, Bloom was just coming out of sabbatical and he needed a graduate assistant. And so he called me and asked if I wanted that. He had, uh, uh, Moy had sent him all this stuff. And so I, I was admitted, I kind of on the phone, interestingly. I don't, I don't know if I, I still am trying to figure out if I ever submitted a formal application packet. I, I just <laughs> think that we talked about it and uh, there I was. And so mm -hmm. I, I, I graduated, uh, I was 28 years old when I got my PhD. And uh, PhD was in measurement evaluation and statistical analysis, abbreviated MESA. And we thought uh, as a group of students, we thought we were by far the best. There was a little bit of egocentrism among the group, you know, oh, that's the history of ed group. Oh, that's the, you know, this group and we're MESA. So uh, uh, I got a, I took a job at the University of Chicago, uh, University of South Carolina, and I stayed there for my entire career. And the reason I took it was uh, things I had learned teaching that I needed more flexibility. I, I interviewed a, play, a few places where they were going to slot me in something. You know, there was already a position, and that's what I was going to fill. Whereas at the University of South Carolina, they were just starting to develop their doctoral programs. And so there was a lot of flexibility. And I think that's probably the reason that I, I went there. And then I, uh, somewhere after that, I got married and had children, two boys. And then I, uh, I kept on thinking, should I leave? Should I leave? And I never did. So I ended up uh, 33 years uh, service to the University of South Carolina, and I retired in, uh, I think it was 19, no, I was, I can't remember, I don't know. I, was, I think I read someplace it was 2006. That's probably right then. <laughs> I, would, I would guess that that's right. <laughs> and so, yeah, because it was 33 years, I, that's right. I could, if I did the math, since I'm a math person, <laughs> I could, 2006 minus 1973, darn if that's not 33 years. Yeah, it was it was a good thing I did my homework here, but uh, yeah, yeah, right. So you, but you've not been uh, resting on your laurels in retirement. You've still been active. Can you can you tell us? Okay, so after retirement, what did you do? Gardening for a while and get tired of that, and then and then find something else, or what happened after retirement? Well, I one of the reasons I retired early is I had so many opportunities to do international work, uh, uh, international research, co collaborative research with colleagues in, in different countries and so forth and so on. And I, I retired not because I didn't like to teach necessarily because I was a little better by then, but it, it was really uh, heads or tails. You know, am I, am I going to, I couldn't do a good job teaching and take these, uh, in, accept these invitations. And so the way to accept the invitations was basically to stop, you know, completely. And mm -hmm. so, I just went into uh, consultantships and, and uh, uh, collaborative research uh, designs. And uh, it, that's basically where I've been since 2006. Can you share with us the, uh, uh, the focus or foci for some of these uh, endeavors? Well, uh, yeah, part of it was, uh, part of it was uh, the consultant part was more curriculum design, curriculum development. Uh, uh, it, and, it, and a lot of those invitations came out of uh, a, a book that I co-edited uh, called a, a Taxonomy of, of uh, Learning, Teaching, and Assessing, a Revision of Bloom's Taxonomy, which uh, we published in uh, 2001. Okay, and uh, that really uh, gave me a lot of... Uh, entrees into uh, countries that were interested in, in improving curriculum and states. I worked a lot with uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, uh, Pennsylvania, and so forth and so on, most on the East Coast, but that was just a 
proximity more than anything else. So that's what I was doing on, on, on that side of the yes, consulting side. The research side, I was doing more with um, uh, colleagues that were interested in research on um, economically disadvantaged, uh, minority, marginalized students. Um, so I would, you know, collaborate with research in, in the uh, former Yugoslavian states, um, uh, South Africa, um, uh, places like that, that we were trying to get a handle, uh, Brazil, uh, trying to get a handle on um, what we knew and how to do, uh, you know, how to do research on certain areas. Like, for example, just a real quick example, there's an international uh, uh, test called PISA. And, you know, for some reason, people went crazy and, and they started ranking te uh, school uh, te uh, countries based on PISA scores and so forth and so on. And in collaboration with uh, several different people, they realized that uh, the floor of, of PISA was too high. You know, it wasn't that the ceiling was too low. It was that the floor was too high for a lot of these uh, developing countries. And so in the last, I don't know, several years, they, they have something now called PISA D, which is like developmental. And that came out of research, collaborative research, where we said, we're not getting really good data on, on students in these countries because they are unfortunately so far below the floor of the current PISA that we need to make the floor a little bit lower to get more reliable data on them. Can you share with us a little more about that and what are some of the, the the issues that you uncovered uh, and discovered the need for, you know, adapting PISA to, to, to development, developing countries where people are, you know, starting at a, I guess a lower level is what I'm reading into what you've just said. Well, it's a, it's a, uh, the, the, if you look at some of those countries that, that we're talking about, uh, and, and if you think of poverty in the United States, then multiply your idea of poverty in the United States by about 50. <laughs> and, and you will start to understand what we're talking about when we talk about poverty in some of these countries. Um, you also have um, huge ethnic uh, differences in the countries. So it's not only uh, income or uh, it, it uh, for example, um, the, the Roma, which are also known as the gypsies. Okay. Right. Uh, if, apparently, no one likes the Roma <laughs> throughout, throughout Western, uh, Eastern and Western Europe. And when, uh, so when uh, uh, they, uh, Croatia decided that they wanted to be part of the European Union, the European Union operates under a general uh, mandate of education for all. And so you had to have an educational plan that incorporated all of everybody that was there. And uh, so we tried to work with uh, uh, policymakers, administrators, politicians, <laughs> educators to say, uh, how, do, how, how are we going to develop a plan that, that includes rather than excludes the Roma? And uh, the, the, that's, that's a type of problem that we tried to solve. I mean, I was shocked with the fact that uh, uh, as, ma as many or more Roma were exterminated by the Germans in World War II, as were the Jews. Mm -hmm. So they've, the Roma have had a problem <laughs> for a long time. And... Uh, most of the people, they're you know they're they're uh, they're they're they're, lot, they're not trustworthy, <laughs> they're lazy, um, and we started to find out that they're really it's it, it's an interesting thing because the it's it's very gender specific that girls work with their mothers, boys work with their fathers, and the the the, the mothers want their uh, 
want their uh, daughters to move up in society so they marry better. And so it's very, it was very important in Croatia for the Roma girls to learn Croatian. Whereas when it came to the boys, the boys used Romani, which is their language. And, and it was almost like a code, that that's the way they could talk to their parents or their father. The father could talk to the son without other people knowing what they were talking about, which on the one hand was really nice because they were learning the apprenticeship thing, but it created even more concern. What are they saying? Who's yeah. <laughs> are they talking about me? Uh, so a lot, that's what I'm saying. A lot of it was, was uh, identifying the problem first. You know, I can't remember who it was that said a, a problem well defined is a problem half solved or whatever the heck the, that thing was. But that was true. I mean, our, the, the first order, what is really the problem we're dealing with? And then let's go out and see what we can uh, find that may help solve this problem. And with, with the Roma issue, it, we made, I think we made inroads, at least on paper. Uh, you know, for example, in almost all, uh, whether, whether they're uh, immigrants or indigenous tribes, because a lot of the indigenous in Canada and the United States are basically Roma-like, mm -hmm. uh, how to incorporate the best of their cultures into the education system. You know, the Roma had songs, the Roma had uh, stories. The, the, uh, the, there were a lot of things that, that could be used as examples to teach fairly standard curricular issues. Now, I'm not, because of the personal, the, you know, antipathy toward the Roma, I'm not sure that anything we wrote on, that was written on paper ever was, implemented, you know, but after a couple of years, at least we had something that we could, they could put down and then submit to the EU to, uh, to move forward. It seems to me that a lot of the, you just talked about are, are prevalent in our world today here in America. And uh, it's, these are issues that just haven't gone away. So what, what, so incorporating cultural elements from from your target audience if you will into how you approach you know curriculum I, I guess is one of the takeaways is there are there any other uh, you know sh short well, yeah well the other the other one it was as I said the, the uh, lowering the floor of Pisa which is another adaptive kind of a situation mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, utilizing the strengths of cultures that are not mainstream cultures, I think is another one. Um, uh, I think that the other one, uh, you know, it, it's it, it's been it's been amplified by the education in COVID nineteen. I just did a an article on that, which will appear in a, a Serbian journal in English because I don't write Serbian. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, 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 what's called the digital divide, that as we move more toward um, uh, using um, the, the distance education, uh, you know, that type of thing, using screens like we're doing, um, if you go into some of these poor countries, the, the digital divide is huge. I mean, you, have, you go into some countries where maybe 10% of the students have access in, in, in the home to any kind of uh, computer. And then once you have the computer, then you have to link it up. So, so you have to do the yeah. computer plus the internet access, okay? And if anything, uh, what COVID-19 has done in, in a lot of these countries is to amplify the uh, magnify, I guess would maybe be a better choice of words, the, 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 the huge uh, the digital divide that exists in, in, in countries, uh, you know, throughout the world, much less so in the United States, but it's, it's a problem here as well. Mm -hmm. well. Well, thank you for giving us that background here. If I can circle back a little bit to some of your work at the, the University of Southern uh, Carolina. Um, so you, you're, 
your focus was on uh, research, as I remember, and curriculum. Um, can, can you, so who are your, where were your students going? Were they going into educational jobs in, in the educational system, or were they going into enterprise and, and doing, uh, uh, you know, training uh, in, in training and or learning and development organizations? Can you tell us a little bit about what your work? Yeah, uh, we, we, we had uh, uh, basically three groups of students. Um, the, the, the majority of them um, went into um, agencies, uh, uh, state agencies, regional agencies, uh, larger uh, school districts um, that uh, as uh, assistant superintendents for research or they were, they were in the research group of, of um, the state departments of education Mm -hmm. That was the largest number. I would say that was probably 60% of our graduates. Uh, the second one was uh, uh, small colleges. They were faculty, they became faculty members in small colleges. Very, very seldom did they go into, you know, tier one research universities. That was, that's basically what Harvard does and Chicago does and Stanford does and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. But uh, the smaller uh, colleges and universities, we were able to place a number of our students. And I would say that was probably uh, 25%. Okay. Uh, the other 15%, I hope that's right. Uh, <laughs> the other 15% uh, went into uh, industrial businesses and so forth and so on. Um, and, and, uh, they were they they were there before the term big data even was uh, started, but that's kind of what they were doing. Okay, uh, you know, without the name, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, trying trying to work through um, providing getting data so that uh, people could provide uh, feedback and, and and make improvements and so forth and so on. So. Well, that's, that's basically the, the three that uh, I think we've produced. Uh, no, I, I'm talking not only about the, I only work with doctoral students. So, you know, th that only applies to those that were graduating with uh, PhDs. Well, as we discussed a, a little bit uh, in our, both in our uh, email exchange before doing the video and then just before we hit the record button uh, today, uh, this series is about human performance technology, which is really evidence-based practices for performance improvement. So it's interesting that you just brought up big data um, because I think that measurement and evaluation is so central to uh, good practice, whether it's simply in instructional system design or beyond instruction into other uh, uh, act, uh, the other factors with uh, that affect performance human performance in, an, in any kind of a process, in any kind of a setting. Um, but you, so you were steeped in, in measurement and you're a math guy and all of that. So can you tell us a little bit about um, some of, who were some of your early influences when you first started off in your career? And what, I, what I'm trying to do is elicit from you some people or books or articles that those in our audience, if they're interested in measurement and evaluation, um, you know, who were some of the, the, those things that influenced you so that we might point others to them? So can you, you know, hearken back to the old days and uh, yeah. what are some of the classics? Um, not that you're an old guy, but you know, I am too, but not quite as much, but uh, so, so, because there's a lot to be learned from the past and too often people that are entering the field just get what's, you know, the, the latest and greatest, so supposedly, but they, but they don't understand the underpinnings for, you know, where we are right now as a profession. So who, who were some of those people or books or articles that you might point people to that you, had an impact on you? Well, uh, let me start by agreeing with you hundred percent that uh, I'm, I'm a great believer in delving back and trying to find origins of ideas. And because I find that the or if you find the origin of an idea, 
the writing that was done at that time is probably some of the best writing we've had. They really were thinking about some of these issues. Uh, for example, the notion of grading students, how to grade students. That really was not an issue until we went with mandatory secondary schools. And everybody kind of, we go, well, we got to figure out how to do this. We can't, you know, talk to Mrs. Smith about her son anymore. We have to have something a little more uh, efficient than that. That was in the 1920s when, when that happened. And the number of high schools expanded tremendously, okay? So if you really want to understand some of the issues surrounding grading students, go back and read those things that were written in the 1920s, because the debates were there and the options were there. And I think it goes back to something that I mentioned earlier, and that is, I'm a, I'm a very pragmatic person. If you don't have a problem that, that you're trying to solve, I don't want to work with you. Okay. And so the, this, the, when you go back and look at grading and you look at that particular period of time, you, they, they first of all, they, uh, they point out what is the problem here? What's the problem we're trying to solve? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's so much of that. Uh, eva evaluate, I'm gonna get to your, <laughs> to your question. No, no, fine, you're doing right. <laughs> Same thing with evaluation. Uh, uh, education evaluation as we know it, okay, didn't really start until the late 60s when the federal government started to kind of get involved in it. And so we had something like the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which people sometimes know as Title I or Chapter I or whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, the National Defense Education Act, which, uh, which uh, was after the Russians scared the hell out of us <laughs> by launching Sputnik, and we, we got concerned about that particular thing. So if you want to really figure out what some of the issues are in educational evaluation, go back and read the, the stuff that was written in the late 60s, early 70s. I'm always so disappointed when I read current stuff. Because as I read current things, I say, we've already addressed that 10 years ago. We've already addressed that 20 years ago. And it'd be better for people to know what happened 20 years ago and then talk about how what they're talking about adds to the knowledge base that we had 20 years ago. But if you don't know the knowledge base 20 years ago, uh, everything's new. You know, let's try this, let's try that. There was something that I read uh, not long ago on the importance of active learning time. Okay, the, 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 the title of my uh, doctoral dissertation was Time in School Learning. Okay, and I'm reading this stuff and I, I didn't expect them to reference something back in 73 and a couple articles after that. But it, I was always shocked with they, they, they had a reluctance to go beyond uh, 2000. That, that 2000 was old. And, and you kind of go, gee, you're missing the whole point. There were some issues at that time. It, you know, and if you think about uh, the, the, the 60s, uh, in addition to the beginning of evaluation, it was also the notion of uh, adaptive education, you know, that instead of one size fits all, how do we individualize, how do we adapt and so forth and so on. Um, but you gotta go back to that time to do that. Anyway, that's a preamble to answering your question. Okay, so I just wanted to say, yes, I, 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 I'm wholeheartedly in agreement that, uh, that that's the, the case. The, the uh, the, the people that have, uh, ha you know, I'm not going to get into my high school math teacher, which is probably why I got into majoring in math, because he was excellent. Uh, I, I, uh, there was a man at, the, at McAllister College who had a grant to uh, uh, engage uh, undergraduates in educational research. Okay, and I, I took a two semester course in that where I got interested in educational research. So all of those things, I think, are there. Um, the way I kind of look at it is that um, Bob Dylan in his book, uh, Dylan's from Hibbing, yay Hibbing, 
uh, that uh, Bob Dylan in his book differentiates between what he talks about as influencers and what he talks about as enablers. So for, for uh, Dylan, uh, Woody Guthrie was an influencer. But the person who signed him to his first uh, record deal, <laughs> he was an enabler. And I, I've always, since I read his book, uh, Chronicles, uh, I, 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 that's just such a good way of, of thinking about your past. There were, there were influencers, and the two I'm mentioning, plus, plus the uh, you know, others around the way, the, 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 those were the early, early, early things. Now, I talked about uh, Moy Gum at my, my master's. He was an enabler because without Moy Gum, I never would have ended up at the University of Chicago. Okay, so uh, in terms of what, when I get into my adulthood, though, <laughs> when I get past uh, that, I would say that uh, the, the 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 number one influence on my life uh, in terms of what I read was uh, was Ralph Tyler. Uh, Tyler was uh, an incredible individual. Uh, he was involved in something called the Eight Year Study, which went from 1934 to 1942, and uh, his uh, think the way he thought about evaluation and how to evaluate students. Uh, to go beyond kind of the routine memorization of things, the solving problems and and uh, critiquing and so forth and so on was was, was simply uh, incredible. That uh, I think that he he influenced my thoughts on uh, the, the the possibilities in evaluation, which on the one hand was really good, and then on the other hand was uh, part of the things that led to my being cynical because, because when, you th when you see the possibilities and then you look at life and you see how poorly we do some of the things we do, there's this divide. And, um, you know, I, but Tyler clearly is one of the people that I, I, I really, um, and he wrote quite a bit. Um, he started the Far West Behavioral Laboratory out in Stanford. Um, uh, he, he really was a, he started uh, what's called Science Research Associates, which is a publishing company and, or, you know, and so forth and so on. Uh, another person that just really kind of opened my eyes was a man named John Carroll, uh, who um, wrote a, a number of things, but the one that got to me was something uh, where he talked about, um, it got me interested in the whole time thing. Um, and, and, and what Carol basically did was he was look, he was a foreign, he was in foreign languages at the time, and he was trying to figure out how well uh, foreign language aptitude tests predicted the learning of uh, a foreign language. And he found out that uh, it predicted reasonably well correlations of such and such and such and such. But because he was really uh, a curious person, he said, I wonder why it doesn't predict better. And so he came up with a model of school learning that, that turned everything on its head. Uh, what he argued was something like this. If, if you have in, uh, differences in uh, aptitude for learning a particular language and you give everybody the same amount of time to learn it, you're going to end up with not only differences, but increased differences in learning. So if you hold time constant, that the, the variability going in is going to exceed <laughs> when you move out, that the exit variability is going to be bigger. He said, what if we wanted everybody to learn a foreign language? and we held some level of performance constant, then we'd have to vary time. Okay, I mean, it was, it, was, it was brilliant. It was absolutely, it was so simple and yet absolutely brilliant. So the issue now became, if, if it's really important for you, 
you know, to, to, to learn something. And I think this fits into, I, I, I did a lot of consulting with the uh, career technology educators in North Carolina. And I wondered why they were a lot more receptive to, to what I was saying than the academic side. And I think what I came to is that what they teach, they believe to be important. Okay, if you're gonna weld, <laughs> you gotta learn to weld. Okay, whereas if you get into math or uh, literature, I, I, they don't have the same thing. You know, their view more is, well, I'll ex we'll expose all these kids to this and whoever learns, learns. And, you know, they may learn different things, but, you know, not, not everybody's going to be a mathematician anyway, or not every, you know, da 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 Whereas when you get into career technology, they nail it. You know, um, music teachers, they nail it. <laughs> okay, either, either you're on key or you're not. <laughs> whether you're singing or playing an instrument or whatever the case may be. And, and so that came out of Carol, that, that came out of John Carroll's stuff that, yeah, we, we, we have an idea of what's proficient in an, in an area. If we really want to get everybody there, we either have to select clones at the beginning, okay? Or we have to find ways of varying the time some kids need a little more practice. Some kids need more this, more that, more that, so that the time variation then produces a similar level of, not identical, but a similar level of proficiency. So Tyler is one, Carol is another. Um, you know, uh, a, a lot of the old, early, early, early curriculum people um, I, I read. Um, you know, uh, there's uh, the, another one was um, uh, Roger Barker from Stanford. Um, he came up with something called ecological psychology. Um, and each ecological psychology means that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's like social psychology. And it's, it's the notion of, of uh, psychology in context. Okay. And he argued, which uh, again, I, I, I love, I, I, what always triggered things in my mind is people who just hit something like Carol, like Tyler, that just made you think. It just turned the world on its head. And it, it took where you were and said, no, <laughs> okay, let's, let's flip it around and see where you end up. And Barker did the same thing. What he basically argued was that if you know the if you know the environment really well, you can predict people's behavior better than knowing the people. Now that's a, that, again, think about that for a minute. I don't need to know the individual differences. I just need to really understand the environment. One of the examples he gave was religious institutions. Okay, if you know you're in a Catholic church, <laughs> all right, Makes no difference uh, who, who those people are. Okay, you're gonna see behaviors that are consistent with what's acceptable, what he called standing patterns of behavior in that environment. Uh, and, and schools have that. You know, elementary schools particularly have that, where you have a routine <laughs> that's set up. And one of the first things teachers try to do in the first two weeks of school is get that routine internalized. And then from there on out, we can do other things. But if I don't get the routine set up, where I know that if we're going to go to the washroom, the kids have to be on this side and they don't run. And okay, when, if we're, how we're going to distribute papers, where are you going to put your name on the paper? Okay, the date on the paper, etc. All of that stuff is a standing pattern of behavior. And once you know that, you can predict behavior regardless of who the individuals are. So, you know, those are three that I really, and, and, and there are a lot more. I mean, I, I, I just can't tell you how many things. But if you look at the, what they three have in common, as I mentioned earlier, is that they, they, they just forced me to think completely differently from what I brought to reading it. 
when I when I ended up the reading, I went, wow, that is absolutely phenomenal. Well, thank you for those three uh, excellent examples, and I I was really that's, I was really intrigued by all of them, but then this last one. Um, th that kind of speaks to culture and organizational cultures and what what's uh, what are the consequences and what's expected, what's demanded, what's reinforced, what's uh, extinguished or discouraged. Right. Um, and that kind of drives behavior. Now, there are things that, you know, you may not, I may not be able to behave a certain way because I don't have the knowledge or skills to do so. And then you can work on that. But once those that that expectation is kind of set, Do, or am I reading that wrong? Or is that no, no, that that's absolutely right. Yes. Well, thank you, Th but thank you for for all that. So my next question was going to be, and I don't know if well, we let me let me add, add one thing to what oh, you just please said. Go ahead. No, no. There's a wonderful book called uh, "Orbiting the Giant Hairball." <laughs> it's a great it's a great book. I know the uh, okay. It was written by uh, a person who um, uh, worked for Hallmark Cards, but he was in charge of their uh, their, their their kind of uh, funny ones, you know, not their uh, you know clean the heart kind of clinging to the yeah. heart type of thing. And the way he described his success was you got to think of Hallmark as this giant furball. <laughs> and to be successful, you have to orbit it. And orbit means you got to be close enough to the hairball so that you're accepted, but you have to be far enough away from it to do your job. And I thought, yeah, in many institutions, many businesses, that's the key to success. That there's a certain amount of things in all of our uh, jobs that define the hairball. And you better know what that hairball is. And then you better know how far out <laughs> you can be and, and, and be successful and still be yourself. Okay, um, and, and do the other job that you need to do. And, and I think that, you know, that's an, I, I don't know who wrote the book. As I said, he was somebody who worked for Hallmark, but that was, a, and it's a very short book, but I thought that helped me understand uh, uh, the relationship between uh, individuals and subgroups and these major, major uh, businesses, IBM, um, you know, uh, various uh, city banks <laughs> okay, that, that, it, that and, and it's related to what I said about uh, ec ecological psychology that there is this thing okay and you better darn know that thing and know how to behave within that thing and once you know that then you can start to uh, work your way out a little bit and see how far you can go and then as you find out you're going too far then you and come back around again and you find the place that you need to be to be both a person that is affiliated with the organization but has your own individual uh, point of view or job or whatever you want to do so i thought that was a good analogy of what we're trying to do i like that i've, I've read the book but i have never read it but to me it seems like that's you know, keeping one foot planted uh, firmly in reality, but having the other foot kind of edging out towards idealism and which I think is important for people who want to innovate. You can't be you can't innovate so far from the from the place that you're at that because people then maybe can't make that giant leap. You've got to be more incremental about that and you can't right. go against cultural norms. Uh, all of them all at once, maybe you can break a cultural norm every once in a while, but but see, people have to see the promise and all of that. But uh, Right. And to realize that there are consequences of doing so. Yes. Yeah. Now, I mean, if there is some risk involved, and so risk management, um, um, assessing the risk and, and understanding what's the value potential for, for make, making a change, not for just the sake of change, but that it has some 
some potential impact. Now you may not be able to predict all of that, but uh, no, no. But uh, yeah, there's people who just you know want to want to sit outside the box all the time, and and then they can't relate to people who are inside the box. And right, right. You don't make any. Well, you know that's a good point because in order to think outside the box, you got to know the box. Yes. Yeah, the, <laughs> you know, people they use that term all the time, and and it's it's meaningless. You know that oh, I'm just thinking outside the box, and I always say, oh, what's the box? Yeah, yeah. To okay. me, the box was always the the were the requirements or constraints on a thing, a person, an organization, their processes, or whatever. But you, but this is because they're the current constraints. Doesn't mean that they have to be the future constraints. There may be some way to innovate around that, and. You know, you don't have to break the mold entirely. You just have to maybe reshape it. Right, um, right. But, th but thank you. But thank you for those, for, for pointing our audience to those people and uh, what what impacts they had to you, because I think that was really critical. I, I really uh, enjoyed that. And I will uh, follow up and, and look uh, to see what I can learn from those people. Let me shift gears here a little bit. Uh, so my, my next question is about a 30 second elevator speech. And I, I asked this uh, to provide our audience with some examples of what, what something like that may be. And I normally set this up by saying, if you're at a neighborhood party and there's a new neighbor and they come up and say, Lauren, what do you do? Now, you're retired now, so there, I think you have maybe two versions. Something that you would have said before you retired, as you explained, you know, briefly, concisely, you know, what it is that you do. And nowadays you're doing something not that dissimilar, but it, but it has changed. So you can do two of them or one of them, but how would you explain as a way of an example to, for our audience? What's your elevator speed and what it is you do? Well, it, yeah, I think there are two, I agree. Uh, uh, if I think about what, how I would answer that question while I was a faculty member, an active faculty member, it would be that um, I work with uh, graduate students to help them develop the uh, knowledge and skills and research to complete doctoral dissertations. That, that's what I do. Okay. Um, and, and it was, I love that kind of teaching because uh, I, the most I ever taught was like groups of three or four that were working on similar issues. I mean, and a lot of it was individualized. Mm -hmm. So that would have been the answer. That would have been my elevator speech for this is what I do. Uh, now, uh, it's, it's, it's much harder to do an elevator speech because I, the variety of what I do right now is uh, much larger. Um, I, uh, as I mentioned before we got on, on the air, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a member and president of something called the International Academy of Education. And that has been a real challenge during the, uh, the pandemic year, try to maintain uh, contacts and activities and so forth and so on of this 50 plus membership in, in this International Academy of Education. And right now, for example, we're working on, uh, we've got, we, we admitted uh, five, uh, nine new people over the last two years. And we're trying to set up uh, a, a kind of an introductory welcome type of Zoom with them. Now, <laughs> one of the problems we have is they range all the way from California to Singapore and Japan. <laughs> so how do you set up a Zoom uh, you know, that covers that level of distance in terms of time zone and so forth and so on? So I spend quite a bit of time on uh, academy activities. Um, I, um, I, I write, uh, I do research and writing still. Uh, Fortunately, most of my writing right now is in response to invitations, and that's a big shift. That when you start out, you you uh, submit and pray, <laughs> and and uh, now it's it's uh, it's more we need to do this. Like the the book that we did on the nurturing of young educational researchers, 
came out of a need expressed by people in Mexico. And it's in a, there's, it actually started in a Spanish version and then was translated into English. And the notion there was that they had such a uh, expansion of graduate programs in education because to meet the need of accreditation agencies. And you had people teaching research that didn't know anything about research. I mean, they, they knew their field really well, but uh, you know, what, what, should a, what should a research institution look like? And so we brought together about uh, eight or 10 people from all over, uh, Germany, Israel, um, you know, Canada, United States, and so forth, and wrote uh, what we think would be the uh, minimal requirements for establishing a defensible, uh, uh, effective uh, doctoral program for training educational researchers. That, that, so, you know, it's a long, I hope the elevator is a long ride. <laughs> But it's, it is so much more difficult now uh, because of the variety of, of what I do. I do some writing, I do some consulting, I, I, I do some administrating and relative to the academy. I mean, every day is a little bit different. Well, let's, let's so, so what you were just talking about is some of the work that you've done here with the International Academy for of Education. So can, tell us a little bit about that organization. You said there's 50 plus members in it, but right. what's the mission? What are some of the products and services you render? And, and is it for you know, governmental agencies or, or what? But what, circle back and, and talk a little bit about it. Okay, that. well, it's, it, it, uh, it's been around for probably um, 30 years, I guess, uh, roughly speaking. Um, uh, uh, there's a website. Uh, and, and if you really, you know, if people are interested in it, they should, you know, in terms of the history and all that type of stuff. But in a nutshell, what we're about is uh, uh, forming uh, uh, informal uh, collaborative groups to work on common problems in education. Okay. Um, and, and so the, the COVID. 19 issue is a common problem and we've had people work together and contribute to uh, edited books and so forth and so on on that um but that that's prime that's the primary uh goal of it is to provide a, a, a way of getting people together and and uh, it, a diverse group of people not only uh geographically diverse but also gender diverse uh, I, I, we, we haven't done as well on that as we should. Um, I would say somewhere, maybe 30% uh, of the membership is women, are women. And, and also uh, uh, discipline uh, diverse. So we have economists, uh, we have historians, uh, we have instructional systems design people, uh, psychologists and so forth and so on. And I think it's, that's what makes it special that you can, a lot of associations uh, aren't uh, they, particularly um, like the you know, Mass, National Science Foundation, they're scientists, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, but by having that diversity in disciplinary uh, uh, learning, I think you, uh, you get people that have different ideas. And what it also does is to promote respect of one another. You know, people who people who uh, I find people who are who argue with one another, they argue in the same vein or the same language. But if I'm talking to an economist, which I'm not, uh, I listen better, and I might not disagree. I might not agree with the person, okay, but I respect that person and that person's work. And I think I've learned that through membership in, in the academy. Okay. We uh, produce, uh, uh, you asked about the audience. One of our main audiences is uh, practitioners. Um, and we have uh, a series of booklets that can be accessed on the website that, are <clears throat> that, that target particular issues 
um, and they're very short. Uh, so you can kind of, you know, and they're set up around recommendations and research. Here, here's our recommendation. Here's the research that supports it. And each one is targeted toward uh, some identified need or some identified problem that people have. Um, we used to have a policy series as well, but <clears throat> that one uh, fell, it's, it's, it's inactive. That was set up for policymakers, legislators, and so forth. Um, and um, it, 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 the stuff that's in it is pretty good, but um, it was a lot of people find it very frustrating to try to write for that audience because even this, the shortness of it, okay, they're very short. It's still more than the one page that most policymakers want. <laughs> so we didn't get as much of a reception of, with the policy series as we did with the practices series. But there's, I think there's probably 50, 60 booklets in the practices series right now. And we have two more in, as we try to do two to three a year uh, based on uh, current issues and problems. The one that's under, uh, uh, preparation in preparation right now is one dealing with uh, education in emergency situations. We wanted to broaden beyond COVID because if you look internationally, there are a lot of emergency situations, uh, whether they're uh, earthquakes, tsunamis, or even uh, uh, having difficulty with girls attending school because uh, you're in a country where that's a bad thing, and they're they're kidnapped or they're killed. So how do you provide education uh, in a context like that? So that's that's not out right now, but that's forthcoming. I will be include in our show notes here for the YouTube video the URL to your group. We we discussed that here before we hit the record button. Um, let me shift gears uh, again slightly here is that, uh, you know, you're a lifelong learner, obviously. And so can you tell us what you are focused on right now? And if you're doing any writing or anything about that, but wh where, what's your focus for what you're trying to learn? Um, I, I have been trying to, I've, I've done a lot of historical <laughs> reading, which is consistent with what I said before. Uh, and I'm trying to really get a better understanding on, on some of uh, the tricky issues in, in life, okay? Uh, particularly as they apply to education. For example, uh, behavior, take something like behavior. I was taught uh, in my graduate program that you use behavior to make inferences about what was going on in the mind, that you couldn't see it. And so you made inferences based on test performance, based on observations and so forth. But the behavior was always a means to an end. And then I got into working with the career technology people, okay, where the behavior is the end. That uh, you know, so how do you how do you put these two pieces together? And it turns out that the easiest way to do it is to realize that they both exist, and you have to be very clear at the beginning uh, which view of behavior you're taking, because it has whatever view you're taking has tremendous implications for education. Uh, the other thing that it sets up uh, is the fact that uh, even when behavior is the end, that you're worrying about performance, there's a lot of cognition that goes into that particular thing. And, and that has led me to the notion of balance. You need, a, you need balance between knowledge and skill. If you go too far in knowledge and no skill, you know things, but you can't do anything with it. But if you go too far on skill and not enough knowledge, okay, everything's fine as long as things are going well. <laughs> but as soon as you run into a problem, you're back to a, you know square one pretty much. And the the thing I the, I learned that from the HVAC repair group of CTE because they they're big on troubleshooting. 
Okay, uh, and troubleshooting is a combination. You, you, there's a certain uh, parameters that you have in your mind, how the system works, how it's supposed to work and so forth and so on. But there are a series of tests that you have to, have to do at the same time. But if you do the wrong test, it's not gonna give you what you want. Okay, and it, 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 conversely, if you don't have the right tool for the test, then you have to go back to the back to the truck <laughs> and so forth and so on. So, so balance became kind of a second thing I've been really trying to work through. That how do you get people to realize that that you need both? You know that, for example, uh, there's a, there's a, a, t a test out there called Tim's. The, it has to do with international mathematics survey. And they, they're so proud of the fact that they are uh, doing different levels of, of cognition. So you've got uh, kind of recall and you have understanding and applying and you have critical thinking and so forth and so on. And I've done some research on that recently. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna do a, uh, a uh, presentation. I'm a keynote, long distance <laughs> keynote speaker in May in the Philippines. And one of the things that I found was that if you're talking about mathematics, I don't care uh, how much thinking you do, if you don't have the basic knowledge, you're gonna get the wrong answer. I mean, that, that it's as simple as that. Or if you have knowledge, but it's the wrong answer, if you misunderstand something. For example, one of the items was absolute value. What's the absolute value? And some of the and we were interviewing kids as they were going through. They had to think out loud. And one one of the kids said, "Well, absolute value means that the sign doesn't make any difference." Okay, no, <laughs> that's not what absolute value means. Okay, and he got the wrong answer. It's not that he thought wrong. It's not that he processed it wrong. It, that his assumption, his his knowledge assumption was inaccurate. And there are a lot of things like that, where it's, it's, the, it's the fit of the two, that, that it's, it's how do you put together knowledge with the skills or knowledge with the thinking? Uh, how do you make sure that your understanding of is behavior a means to an end? Or is it the outcome that you're trying to do? I think these are critical issues uh, for uh, really improving education. I mean, th th these to me are such basic issues that if we don't uh, come to some understanding of those issues, no matter what we do, I, I think we're doomed to failure. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, let me shift uh, gears here again here. Uh, my next question has is about uh, terminology. And I'm asking, is there a performance improvement or educational term or phrase that you would like to define for us? And I usually set this up as that you, perhaps you feel that the, as it's currently being used, as you're reading it or seeing it uh, out used in the world, it's being misused or misconstrued and you would like to put your spin on it. So what term or phrase might you define for us? Well, I think the evidence would be the start. I mean, I, I think that I would use evidence. Um, and I would contrast what might be called evidence-based <laughs> uh, education or evidence-based improvement, which I agree with, with the term I don't agree with, research-based. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I've been, I've been, uh, this, uh, this is not my first rodeo. <laughs> I've been around long enough. Uh, research and education uh, doesn't generalize very well. Okay, uh, there's a lot of uh, constraints. And what I've been trying to teach the people I've been working with is what you need to understand if you're looking at a, a, a particular set of research or a particular area of research is, is the question that really should uh, drive you is under what conditions does this work? Not does it work or doesn't it work? But if you look at the body of research that you have, okay, 
where does it work? Where doesn't it? And, I, and I've done a couple of those, one with uh, small classes. If you look at the effect size of small classes on uh, achievement in younger, younger students, uh, they'll range with the uh, sex, uh, effect sizes of 0.1 up to uh, 1.5. And so what people normally do is they report the average medium. And even if there's nobody there, <laughs> and sometimes there isn't. Sometimes you get what's called a bimodal distribution. You know, you got a bunch over here and a bunch over here, and nobody in the middle, but you still report the median. And, and I don't think that's good policy. I think that uh, if, if you say to yourself, under what conditions do these things work? And that's why I don't like research-based. Evidence-based means that you, as a person that's trying something out, need to get the evidence. And the evidence may in fact be uh, more informal. Uh, it might not be as quote scientific, okay? But be, you know, but it's, it's feedback to you about how the kids are learning or how the teachers are teaching if I'm working with them or what the administrative style is and if one is better than the other or whatever the case may be. So evidence to me is more situational specific. Research should be more situational specific, but oftentimes it's viewed as a generalizable statement, a mean or a median or yes versus no. And, and, and if you do it that way, if you do that kind of research, I think the major uh, result of most of these areas of study is um, on average, there's no significant difference between treatment A and treatment B. That doesn't get us anywhere. But to say, under what condition does treatment A work? Under what conditions does treatment B work? Do you need different kind of teacher training? Do you need, to, is it work better for rural than urban schools? Does it work better for mathematics than science? Uh, there's a whole variety of things you can come up with. So I, I really think that if we focus on evidence-based learning, okay, uh, that we may be a, a, a step ahead. Oh, I like that discussion. I've always uh, uh, mistakenly, uh, now I see, thought that evidence-based was just a newfangled phrase for research-based, but I, you, you put a different spin on that for me. And that, that's, uh, I thank you for that, but that's very interesting. But I think, yeah, the conditions under which things work are often not talked about, or as you say, it's overgeneralized as if that's some truism, but it's really only truth contextually. So it's all situationally based. And we too often don't look deep enough in terms of these rules or principles and, and we overextend them beyond, you know, their, their, what, what the data might share with, show us. Thank you. And it's all, it also is, is the reason to go back and uh, do historical reading and research that we talked about before. Because no matter what you're trying to study now, it's been done before. And what you should do is to try to learn from what's been done before, why it didn't work, why it did work, under what conditions it worked, and so forth, so that you can re redesign something that's going to add something new to what we already know. Uh, I, I think if we always focus on starting from scratch, uh, we have a tendency to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, it's, it's not going to help us a lot, and, which is why I think education cycles. It, it doesn't really improve. I mean, if, 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 if we were like medicine, <laughs> we'd have to improve. We're, we're not putting leeches on people and, and, and drawing blood in medicine, okay? But in education, there's so much that is we've been done. We've been doing for a hundred years, um, and not very different whatsoever. And and uh, and I think the reason is that every generation only goes back twenty years. Yeah, and, and they don't have the basis for these kinds of things. And we have too many people that are doing research in education on on uh, pseudo problems. You know, they're. I, I like I like things that are driven by interest as well, but that's not the sole purpose to do research and education. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you again. Um, so my next question is really <coughs> where 
Chris, the earlier question was about who influenced you early on in your career and your personal, your professional development. Uh, my next question is about who are some of the people who are perhaps more recent and, and perhaps at some of your work at the academy or whatever. But so who are some of, again, the, a shout out, uh, yeah. point, point to uh, people and books and articles that, that you've come across more recently um, that you would uh, point our audience to? Who, who would, what would, who and what might that be? Well, and for, and for different reasons, interestingly enough. I mean, uh, the people I'm going to talk about uh, probably hate each other. <laughs> no, they don't really hate each other, but they are um, uh, not necessarily, they wouldn't necessarily agree with each other. But okay. uh, for, for example, uh, Dave Berliner. Uh, Dave Berliner is a, a, a emeritus professor at the uh, Arizona State University and a bit, tremendously good friend. Um, and a member of the academy. Uh, Berliner uh, is, is the, I think in many respects, the ultimate researcher. That he doesn't, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't accept anything on face. Okay, uh, he investigates and, uh, and a lot of what he publishes therefore is, is not something that people like to hear. He and Bruce Biddle did a book called The Manufactured Crisis. And The Manufactured Crisis basically went against all these people who are saying what a crappy education system the United States has. And if you look at the data uh, in, in certain areas, in many different areas, you find out, no, uh, you know, these are people picking out those particular, and that's always a problem with data. You know, pick out the data that supports the position that you want to take. But his, his stuff is really good and uh, very, you know, as a researcher, uh, I, I think he does, he's one of the best around. Another good researcher who would be the, uh, on the other side of the coin is uh, a man named Eric Hanyushek. Hanyushek is a conservative economist. <laughs> okay. And um, there are times when he makes some assumptions that, uh, may not be valid, but if you ignore the invalidity of the assumptions, his work is really good. You know, and I think that's what makes a researcher. It's not, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't always agree with the assumptions, you know, that different researchers have different assumptions, but whatever those assumptions are, once they're stated, researchers engage in a certain process um, and uh, uh, many years ago, that process was labeled disciplined inquiry. That research is disciplined inquiry. And both Dave Berliner and Rick Hanyushek are, are really disciplined <laughs> inquirers, even though their assumptions are quite different. Uh, that that Hanyushek would agree that schools are not very good. <laughs> uh, Berliner would say, you're, you know, they're a lot better than we think. They could get better, but there's a lot of things we're doing that, that are right. I think those are, those are two real quick ones. There's another person that is really very good. Um, he's a Canadian, and his name is Doug Wilms, W-I-L-L-M-S, Wilms. And uh, he's another uh, almost perfect researcher. I mean, uh, the stuff is just really good. What makes him special is uh, how he represents his data. Uh, he represents his data in ways that uh, practitioners can understand it, policymakers can understand it. Uh, he does uh, color codings, he does uh, pie graphs, <laughs> okay? He doesn't do a lot of, uh, you know, formulas and uh, uh, tables and so forth and so on. And uh, uh, he, he has a tremendous concern for, uh, he, he's, the other thing is he's, he integrates various positions. He's, he's not a, a, a psychologist or an economist or whatever. He takes everything he can, can pull from and comes up with uh, ways of interpreting the data because that's really the, 
that's the important part of your academic discipline. It's not how you do the research. You should basically follow the discipline inquiry thing, but it's how you interpret the results. Okay, that, a, that a, a certain group that come out of a certain perspective may interpret it this way. Okay, same data. Okay, so you have to be really cautious to realize who who these people are and what what is what what is what's their framework and so forth and so on. Many years ago, uh, you know, right? It's not long after I graduated from Chicago, having worked with uh, Bloom, I wrote a piece in the Peabody Journal of Education called um, "If You Don't Know Who Wrote It, You Won't Understand It." Okay. And, and if you want, if you read Bloom's stuff, you have to understand Bloom and, and his biases and his perspective on life. And I, I, I uh, contrasted uh, how in education we read with how people in literature read. You know, if, if, if uh, somebody's going to read uh, uh, Hemingway, okay. Uh, truly, as a as a as a critic, a, a literary critic, as somebody who's versed in that field, okay, you talk about Hemingway as a person before you start to look at his stories. Uh, same thing with Fitzgerald and many of the uh, people that are uh, you know recognized in the canon of writing, and yet in education, people read one article by somebody. And uh, you should read multiple articles and you should get to know who, who wrote these things and what their bias is and so forth. I think it's more important now than it ever has been with the tremendous influx of education that we have online and so forth and so on. I mean, we need to start teaching students how to make good decisions. Should I believe this? Shouldn't I believe this? Uh, What's the perspective this person's taking? What's the purpose of writing it and so forth and so on? That's to me now more important than the content. True. Uh, yeah, we're, we're having this influx, this, uh, we're inundated with all sorts of perspectives. And if we don't understand where that person might be coming from, we won't see that uh, what, what twist they may be putting on it uh, for, for whatever reasons uh, that they may have, their biases or their politics or, or whatever. But uh, yeah, the, we're, we're all very much challenged in all that. And we need, we need uh, you know, the, the thing that I keep pushing my you know, people I work with and my students and it is uh, you, need, you need corroboration. You know, uh, you don't want to generalize from a sample of one. It's, it's just, it's not something we do as researchers. And it's the same thing with readers. Don't, you know, don't, don't generalize from one study. Don't generalize from, you know, two, you know, look at, look at how people from different perspectives go across multiple studies. And that allows you then to see the variability and, and start to understand why these perspectives are different. And, and, and I use the word different all the time. I never talk about wrong. I mean, I'm not saying Berliner was right and Hanusek's wrong. They, they just start, they have different starting points, but they're both very, very good researchers. Lauren, thank you so much uh, as part of our wrap up here. Uh, but again, thank you so much for, for, for sitting with me and, and doing this video interview. My final question to you is, um, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, especially those who are perhaps new to the field uh, related to performance improvement or educational research, take, take your pick how narrow or broad you might want to do this. But, but for new people coming in, and they're gonna be they begin climbing the learning and performance curves mm -hmm. and trying to, to master whatever they're focused on. What, what's your advice for new people? I think that uh, the new people, if, if they're like the people I know and myself, um, and particularly those people in education, they always start off by the notion of, I wanna make a difference. <laughs> I wanna have an effect, right? I wanna impact on, right? And I'm gonna tell you that uh, that's a, a, a slippery slope. It took me a long time to realize that I can't control that. 
uh, I, I can write, I can teach, I can uh, do a whole variety of things. Uh, we just did this uh, uh, Zoom, okay? Uh, I can't tell you uh, if this is going to impact anybody. I can't even, I can't tell you if it's going to impact you, right? let alone some of the people who are going to watch it. But I think it's not that, it's just normal. It's natural for young people to, to want to do that, to make a difference. Uh, but be careful. And I think what I, what, what, where I finally started to feel comfortable is when I said, um, I can't control my impact, but I can control my quality, right? I, I can control the quality of my work, okay? I, I, I can make sure that I'm doing the best that I can do. And uh, if, if, I, if I don't have impact, I, I, I can't judge myself harshly because I can't control that. You know, it's just the way it is. And so somewhere along the way, don't stop with that idealism. Don't, don't stop wanting to, to make a difference, to influence. Don't, don't do that. But if you want to stay in the field and be happy, somewhere along the way, you need to realize the fact that don't focus on things over which you have no control. And quality is one of the things uh, that you have control over. Um, and, and, and really, it's the quality of your work that's your contribution to the field. Lauren, thank you again so much for sharing with us today. That, uh, that was very insightful. Um, I wish you well going forward. And I, and I hope to stay in touch with you because I think you're a fascinating guy. But, uh, but I've taken a, a lot of your time today. And uh, I look forward to... Uh, following your work uh, with the International Academy of Education. And uh, I will uh, share all the appropriate uh, URLs and your contact information for those who wish to follow up with you. But again, thank you so much for today. Well, and, and thank you, Guy, because as I said, at my ripe old age, it's just a real uh, honor uh, to, to still be uh, uh, considered someone that has something to, to offer. You know, in many fields, <laughs> Uh, wisdom comes with experience, but for some reason, the only thing that comes in education with, with, uh, with experience is age. <laughs> so it's, it's a real, it's a real, uh, I just appreciate greatly your invitation, Guy. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye.